you are watching Bronx Vignettes. The Bronx is my blood. Um, from barbershops to beat blocks, you know, to just everything about the Bronx is me. The grit, the resilience, the can-do attitude, the history. Um, you know, when I grew up, the Bronx was a city of neighborhoods, and it was about, you know, the people you knew and the things you can do. And I still believe in the people I know and the things we can do. So, for me, there's no place on earth like this great city. I'm proud to be a part of it. I'm proud to walk the streets. I'm proud to hear the beats. I'm proud to smell people's feet. I love riding the train. I love being everywhere. And I'm from north to south and east to west. I have memories across this borough and connections um, to people, to things, and, and to possibilities that inspire me and most importantly inspire my students and their families daily. So I believe that zip code and skin color should not determine outcomes in life. But sadly, here we are in the poorest congressional district in America where life expectancy, same race, same everything else is different here than anywhere else in New York City. So while zip code and skin color should not determine outcomes in life, that's what people tend to look at. And it's up to us to change the narrative and that's why I love doing the work that I do. Because the Bronx can change attitudes now and more importantly, change outcomes now. And that's what we are committed to doing here. Well, yes, I'm humbled to be a top 10 teacher and uh, I'm thrilled that people did buy my book, The Power of the Plant, which helped fund everything that we are doing. But at the end of the day, I'm just one of many. So I believe I'm one of many champion teachers. And teachers change lives. Um, behind every successful person, there is a mentor, an adult, one kind, caring, compassionate person who told the child, I believe in you. And my job is to be that kind, compassionate adult for as many children, as many adults as I can be. What does it mean to be an urban farmer? Well, first and foremost, it means to be able to grow food in cities. But I like to say we grow vegetables, our vegetables grow students, our students grow schools, our schools grow communities, and our communities grow resilience. So urban farming is simply putting a seed in the ground and watching epic happen. So my advice to new teachers is bring your A game daily and no one will go broke giving love. And most importantly, you know, do what you feel compelled to do because children recognize the real but don't forget the mandate of your day job. So while I am very definitely an urban farmer, the job that I do here is around healthy, high-performing students and healthy, high-performing schools. And the two are not mutually exclusive, but make no doubt about it, I'm determined to change poverty, to change equity, and to foster a sense of equality. And that happens by education, because education is the biggest game changer and gateway to opportunity to the world. 
My goal is to send the first cohort of children from the South Bronx to the Bronx High School of Science because zip code and skin color should not determine outcomes in life. Access to quality education should. So I do believe anything and everything that you do is all about passion, purpose, and hope. Sometimes you pick the challenge, sometimes the challenge picks you. As for my foray into urban farming, it was a total accident. I am not a farmer, I'm not a scientist. I have no agricultural or horticultural or scientific background. I am a people person. And I believe that if you plant people in the right environment, amazing things will happen. Um, you know, when you plant seeds in the soil and the seeds don't grow, we don't blame the seeds. Uh, we blame the soil. We look at how we could remediate this. So I see our communities as soil and I see our children as seeds, and I want that soil to be the most fertile possible. And seeds to me represent genetic potential, whether it's the seed of an idea, or the seed of a plant, or the seed of a child, and I want every single organism and every single child to reach their God-given genetic potential and express themselves as thoroughly and as wonderfully and as exponentially as possible. But it is cool to grow food in cities, for sure, to think that here we are in a classroom, four stories up, in a hundred year old building in the middle of public housing that generates over a hundred bags of groceries a week and is inspiring healthy living and inspiring healthy learning, not only for these children, but for people all around the world. That's the recipe for awesome sauce. Hyper local, hyper connected, hyper productive. I like to say we got 99 problems in the South Bronx, but growing fresh food and happy healthy students is no longer one. Growing food is awesome because first and foremost, children really need to know what food is. But growing your own food is not only a ticket to good health, it's a license now more than ever to print money. And in a community with limited means and limited access to healthy, fresh food, the ability to grow it and grow it exponentially and grow it using 90% less water and 90% less space, regardless of seasonality, moves children from being consumers to producers. Now, Food itself, the, you know, the way food is distributed, food is the language through which society reveals its structures. Who has access to what? Who can get what? Where is it available? So by changing the language and the discourse around the ability to grow fresh food and have access to it, we're changing the way people see us, interact with us, and our ability to conduct our dialogue and write our own narrative, which is, again, the recipe for awesome sauce and success. But Closer to home, when children learn that the water that falls from the heavens and the water that's in their toilet bowls is the very same water that they need to grow their plants in school, we're creating the next generation of environmental and social justice eco-heroes. And that's important because right here, this is the battleground. This is ground zero. And not only the South Bronx, communities across America. So when you talk about communities that are marginalized and you know, have challenges, the best way to address those challenges is to have local people fix them themselves, to have people who are apart from the solution to become the integral key to the solution. Right here, our children know that we are the ones we are waiting for. We're not waiting for Superman and he's not coming. There's no white horse and he's probably not gonna find his way to the South Bronx, but we are the ones we are waiting for and these children get to experience that, know that, feel that and grow that daily. Plus, when you put a seed in a child's hand, you know, I still marvel that these little seeds become these gorgeous big plants in no time. You're making that child a promise. You're making that child a promise that they're gonna see that seed grow into something great, which you could sell, you could eat, or you could celebrate. And that, to me, is awesome. And most importantly, when you teach children about nature in this very disconnected, kind of uh, screen-driven world, when you teach children about nature, you teach them to nurture. And when we teach children to nurture, we as a society collectively embrace our better nature. Here it's about empathy and compassion. It's not about who's the number one best-selling anything or you know who's the king of the block. Here, it's the whole garden grows and we all have a part. When they realize that they are part of a living, breathing ecosystem, they tend to be kinder and more empathetic to themselves and others. And that's something I love to grow in this classroom garden. We grow kindness here and possibilities. Oh, the pride that these children feel growing something greater, creating their own food, growing their own food, sharing their own food. Realize in this class, we grow 100 bags of groceries that are given to local seniors 
who are both food insecure and recovering cancer. So for our children to be part of the food is medicine movement for people that they see and interact with on a daily basis is perhaps one of the most affirming things they can do, we can do, and I can be a part of. I am just blessed and humbled to be here. For years, the Bronx has been the least healthy county in all of New York State. And while, while healthcare is the biggest industry in this borough, no surprise there. Imagine moving people from healthcare to self-care. I myself have lost over 100 pounds. The children have banned sugar-sweetened beverages from the school. And what you're doing is when you change their palate and you change their expectation, you change their palate and the trajectory for the rest of their lives. Listen, we've got the clown, the king, the colonel, and every other, you know, uh, the, every other icon on every single corner here in the South Bronx. And in between is the dialysis center. Is that design or default? I don't know. But when you can grow your own food and you realize that processed food is really crap, calorie rich in processed food and everything that we are being force fed is a mess, manufactured edible synthetic substances, that is the ability to then get children to reconnect with what food is, where it comes from, and how vital it is to their own health and their own communities. So the thing that I am growing most here are people, our children, our possibilities. Who knew a simple program in the South Bronx could generate whole school change? Who knew that a simple idea, we're now serving 50,000 students across 20 states and five countries. In the next year, we're going to be expanding to 500,000 students across the country. Imagine that. And that's the power of one thing, people power. That's the power of a seed. That's the power of a locally grown movement. We're not very well funded, you know, we don't do galas. What we do well is we do people and we generate results. And we're not an add-on program. We're not coming in as a savior. We're coming in to say, this needs to be a part of our life daily. The art and science of growing vegetables aligned to Common Core, next generation science there, and whole school daily instruction will really change the way children understand the world, their relation to it, and how we can help heal some of the larger problems that society as a whole, locally and globally, are facing. Climate crisis is real. Climate change is real. We are living in an age and a time where, you know, we have gone from loving people and using things to loving things and using people. And the cost on the planet and on each other has been devastating. What we're doing here is teaching children to heal, to grow. So let me be clear, I am not anti-business. I am very pro-business, but I'm pro-business that is a triple bottom line. Empowering people, empowering communities, generating profit and keeping those profits where they belong, in the communities they generated from, as opposed to an extraction economy. So we've got to move from an extraction economy to a far more circular, green, inclusive economy. And you're running for president? Yeah, I am running for president. You know, I'm going to make America garden again. You yes. can vote for Stephen Ritz at stephenritz.com. Uh, you could buy a new copy of my book called Make It Happen. But most importantly, yes, you know, my platform is simple, to make America garden again. And realize, in World War II, we grew a bulk of the food that we needed for this country right in our front yard. Here we go zero miles to plate. We go from tower to table to tummy. In this classroom, four stories up, 52 weeks a year. That's game changing. There are no diesel trucks here. This food is as hyper local and as hyper fresh as you can get. But most importantly, the children are here daily loving that process and being involved and being engaged. For me, the greatest resource in the world is the untapped potential in underserved and marginalized communities. And the degree to which we resist injustice is the degree to which we are all free. For me, it's just easier to raise healthy children than fix broken men. And that's the basis for the work that I do, the movement behind it, and what brings us all together so that collectively we can grow something greater. I think that's your end quote. <laughs> yes, sir. So there are a lot of things that contribute to school success. I think no child, first and foremost, no child rises to low expectations. So in this classroom, there are some very high expectations and I love seeing children succeed at high expectations. Now more than ever, we've got to give children ways to be engaged. We've got to make them feel a part of being something, a part of doing something, a part of visualizing something, and this works. 
Um, the fact that you know you can do it and grow it and eat it and sell it daily is absolutely the recipe for awesome sauce. But what is it really about? This is just the smoke and mirrors for project-based learning. It's the smoke and mirrors for problem solving. It's the smoke and mirrors for saying, wow, little Johnny, when you show up and take good care of your plants, they're gonna do great. So the plants need you and you need them. It's about being a part of an ecosystem. That's all this really is. Now, more importantly, in a community that has limited access and limited means to healthy fresh food, Many of the children who come to this school are looking and their families are looking to the schools for their primary source of nutrition. The work that we do here then becomes so much more important because they are literally growing themselves and feeding themselves. And what are they doing? Both in a healthy paradigm. Right, so the reaction from parents has been wonderful. The reaction from the community has been amazing. Realize this classroom has been visited by people from over 60 countries and six continents. Um, you know, our humble little classroom in the middle of public housing, you know, we recently hosted the Pope's team. We're here hosting you. Um, but we've been, had millions and millions of views on the internet, the Green Bronx Machine website. Uh, sometimes it gets overwhelmed. Uh, it even shuts down um, due to interest in our program. And again, this is designed to be low cost, scalable, and replicable. So I like to say we are growing something greater and we're telling a whole new Bronx story and I am Bronx proud. The words si se puede really resonate here with me, with my students in the community. I like to say from hope to the Pope and we got to meet him too, so it was awesome sauce. So, you know, Green Bronx Machine has always been kind of, it's been an evolution for sure. It started with overage, undercredited children. Um, it has now become a K-12 program with a very strong emphasis on elementary school children. But it started in the simple belief that we are American, Mexican, Dominican, African Americans, and this is our moment. And children who have traditionally been apart from success could literally learn to grow their way to success in school, through school, and aligned to school. So we started as a workforce development program, really making a great connection between school and jobs, largely rooted in my credibility within the community and the business world to connect children that if you show up, you grow up. If you bring your body, your brain will follow and there's this amazing thing out there called opportunity. We just have to connect children to it. We don't need more sugar sweetened beverages in this, in this community. We need more opportunities. So don't talk to me about education in a community like this if you're not talking to me about employment. And what we started with was the ability to connect young people to meaningful jobs, to careers, to opportunities that they never imagined. And once we got children on that track, wow, it was game changing. And then I had the epiphany that for whatever time I have left on this earth, I wanna spend the most time developing young palates and young mindsets at the earliest possible age to build good habits on top of good habits instead of having to unpack them at a later age. Because it is just easier to raise healthy children than fix broken men. But this movement and this work um, you know, comes from a tragedy in my life as well. My wife and I lost, had some tremendous personal tragedies in our lives. You know, I have to bury your own child is tough. Um, those are sometimes things that people never recover from. But you know, the legacy of our son is that his reach will far exceed his time on earth through programs like this and our commitment to grow something greater for all children in the Bronx and all children around the world. Listen, at the end of the day, teachers change lives and whether they are in conflict zones or earthen shacks uh, or, you know, on wooden floors or, or, you know, sand floors. Whether they're at the best schools in the world or in some of the most marginalized communities in the world, without the education, without the ability to plant a seed, we have nothing. But here, we figured out a way to grow something far greater and to engage children, engage teachers, engage community members, engage stakeholders, and most importantly, you know who's doing it? Us, we the people. This is a people-powered movement. And it starts with us, by us, for us, because there is no justice. There is just, just us in this classroom every day. This work is really about being an equity warrior. Sure, I'm a teacher, but there are probably a zillion teachers better than me. But this is about a fight. It's about a fight for what is right. And the calculus of advocacy is not for me to be my brother's keeper. 
the calculus of my advocacy is to be my brother's brother. I don't want to be your teacher for a term or for a year. I want to be your teacher and your brother for life. So it's not about winning and losing in this classroom. This is a place where one tide lifts all boats. And it takes a village to raise a community. Why did it start in the Bronx is simple. Yo soy aquí. Estamos en casa. This is my home. This is my backyard. And I also have this fundamental belief that people should not have to leave their neighborhood to live, learn, and earn in a better one. Because no matter where you go, there you are. But if you bring a positive mindset to what you do where you are, you have the ability to transform your community right where you're at. And that, to me, is exciting. You know, I don't want to arrest people. I want to arrest bad behaviors. And you do it by changing mindsets and landscapes where you live. So for me, the Bronx is home. The Bronx will always be home. And while I do a fair degree of traveling, and the work has spread both across the country and around the world, to think that the Bronx has given birth to this movement, it's Bronx tested and globally approved. How cool is that? It's proof that anybody can, anywhere. And we've done this repeatedly in some of the most challenged communities in America, and some of the mar most marginalized around the world as well. Some of the challenges are just really the status quo, because quite frankly, the status quo is really working well for a lot of people. It's just not working well for the students and, and community members who live here. It's working great for people who migrate in for jobs. It's great for the people who come and wave the flag and say, we're here to save you. But for the people who are living here, it's a bit different. So I always say, you know, oh, you're in the, people tell me all the time, Stephen, you're in the magic zip code, you know. Great, come move here, come live here. Um, people say that, you know, this is a tough community. The people are tough. Listen, it's tough because people are working three, four, and five jobs at minimum and sub-minimum wage just to make ends meet. You know, the myth about the Bronx is that people are disconnected and don't care. That could not be further from the truth. This community is home to some of the most motivated, dedicated, passionate people in the world who need one single thing, opportunity. One simple thing, some fertile soil. And this program and this movement is all about that. Realize we've taken children from this classroom to the White House and simultaneously brought the White House chef here. This is the only program that I know of that's put a garden both inside and outside the White House. A model of our classroom is inside the U.S. Botanic Garden. I mean, think about it. It's proof that children can do anything and that the sky is the limit. You know, as long as, like a plant, you get up in the morning, you extend your face towards the sun, you take in some good atmosphere, you breathe deep, you transpire, you expire, you let your roots grow and put your leaves to the sun. I think the term food desert is really a media creation. It's kind of from that savior mindset. This isn't a food desert. First of all, a desert is a very viable ecosystem. So the organisms that belong in the desert thrive in the desert. So to call this a food desert is a gross misnomer. This is what I call a food swamp. We've got more flavors of crap floating around here than any other community would tolerate. The way this community is marketed to, the way this community is picked on, the way this community is plucked, really, you know, the, the wallets and the bellies of the rich and affluent are filled on the hearts, backs, minds, and wallets of our students in our community. So for me, this is a food swamp. We've got 65 flavors of soda in the average bodega. Why is it that soda is cheaper than water here in this community? There's a reason, because there are other factors at play. So when you redefine what is possible, you redefine the narrative. And that, to me, is the most important thing. This is not a food desert. It's a food swamp. Um, you know, this community is filled with crap, calorie-rich and processed food. Everything that these children see is a mess, a manufactured edible synthetic substance. These children equate celebrities with food, with product, mindful of the fact that, wow, they don't even know where their food comes from. So when you teach them they can be responsible for it, you teach them that they can be responsible for their lives. And realize this, you wouldn't put vinegar in a Porsche. So these children are my t Ferraris, my Testarossas. The next Barack Obama, the next Sondra Sotomayor, the next Jennifer Lopez is sitting right here in this class with me daily. So I want to give those little bodies and little minds the best fuel possible. And that means healthy, fresh food. We don't need more cheap food. We need better food for more people. 
Cheap food is so damn expensive, it is killing this community. It's killing inner cities and suburbs around the world. Because what it's doing is really moving people from a mom and pop mentality to kind of an extraction economy. Um, when you look at the fact that most of the American diet is now calorie rich and processed food, um, for three years in a row, the average life expectancy in America has gone down. When you look at the life expectancy of these children, and when you look at the fact that despite all the technology and wonderful medical care in the world, this is the first generation of children who will not outlive their parents simply because what they're eating, that's mind-numbing and wholly unacceptable to think as a nation we are eating ourselves to death and that hunger, disease, and disease is the same side of the double coin that we could literally change overnight by simply providing access to fresh food and reducing the consumption of crap? Wow, we owe it to ourselves. Like Mrs. Obama said, the way we treat our children is indicative of who we are as a nation. We've got to stop treating children as epicenters of profit and really look at them as epicenters of potential. And this program teaches them that, to be their own potential. Listen, there's nothing wrong with healthy profits as long as it results in healthy children. And I do believe that healthy children help to redistribute wealth to communities that ultimately, you know, need it more than ever. But the bottom line is if corporations have so much money, maybe they're just making too much damn money. Um, and maybe we need to relook at that as well. I didn't say I'm a socialist. I'm an absolute capitalist, but I'm a people capitalist. And again, I believe the greatest natural resource in the world are my students and my community. And I want to see them thrive. I don't want to see them survive. I want to see them thrive. I want to see businesses come here. But when you have large corporations and pop up, you know, these huge fast food entities, every single mom and pop store on the block goes out. Um, and that to me is unacceptable. You know, my wife says I have this uh, girlfriend network of mom and pop stores, which is true. And I love my people and they love me and I want to make sure they thrive. So I love to shop local uh, and I love to shop small and I love to have a small footprint and a local footprint. And imagine if everybody did that around the world, what a different place this would be. You know, it's absolutely criminal to me when you speak to a little child in this community and you ask them where do they get food and they say the gas station or CVS or Rite Aid or McDonald's. To think that that's what children equate with food is wholly unacceptable to me. And the beauty of a program like that, of like this, is we can change that paradigm overnight. Listen, we're growing our own foods here. I want to see a much broader variety of stores here, and I want to see better access to a larger swath of foods here. But that comes by creating an awareness for it. Listen, we don't need another flavor soda. We don't need another energy drink. I don't need another spicier bag of chips. What we need is access to fresh food and the ability to grow it. And now more than ever, given the environmental constraints of the world and the environmental realities of natural resources, what we're doing here is really the gateway to the 21st and 22nd century. Wow, my favorite meal. I've got a lot of favorite meals. It's always something that's local. Um, it's always something where I know the chef or the person who cooked it. But my favorite meal has to deal with people. So the favorite meal is the one that I have with people I love. And it could be as simple as a nut, a nut a freshly grown tomato, something picked in this classroom. It doesn't have to be elegant. It has to be eloquent. Oh my God, so, you know, I do keep crazy hours. I stay up about 19 hours, 20 hours a day. Um, you know, I believe that the best time to sleep is when I'm dead. I've got a lot of work to do. So I'm determined to be as productive as possible. Uh, so for me, bedtime is usually somewhere around 10 o'clock at night, 9, 10 o'clock at night, and I'm up at 1. Um, if you know and you've seen emails, you know my time for email is usually between 2 and 5 when the world is sleeping, um, when everyone else is sleeping, because that makes me feel like I'm working smarter and I'm working harder. But, you know, I do keep farmer's hours. I'm out before the sunrise, and I'm not home until after the sun sets. And for me, it's about productivity. If I go to bed at night and I see one light on, I'm like, wow, that person is working harder than me. And this is New York City, so there's always a light on. 
If I wake up in the morning and I see one light, I'm like, wow, they got up earlier than me. They're getting opportunities. So I am very driven. I'm very motivated. And um, I enjoy that. It's a little tough for my family because I am both a day, you know, I'm a daytime cyclone and kind of a nighttime Dracula. You know, I'm always up, I'm always moving, I'm always doing something. But I believe that's how you get things done. You know, when you want to when you want to get something done, you know, the best person to ask is a busy person. Um, it's not someone, you know, they're what is it? Uh, slow feet don't eat. So I believe in keeping it moving. I want to feed as many people as possible. What makes me happy is I'm on my second and third generation of healthy, productive children. Children whose lives, children whose lives have been transformed. Um, that makes me happy. What makes me happy is to see children who know what their food is, who say no to sugar-sweetened beverages, who say no to crap and ask their parents to buy them healthy food. What makes me happy is to see young children who have never even been outside of this community travel to Washington, D.C. and talk about the colleges they want to go to. What makes me happy is connecting my children with children around the world around empathy, compassion, kindness, and a sense of culture that sometimes we don't see from the big people. You know, the truth is this, children want to be part of this conversation. The truth is children can make a difference. The truth is children understand that their lives matter. And the truth is it's up to us to give them pathways to success. You know, we're leaving the world for the next generation with problems many of us never even imagined. So if we don't leave them with the tools to get along and care, we're really not doing our job. So what makes me happy is to be happy, is to foster happiness. To give love, you gotta get love. And I like to give it, I like to get it, and I think here we also grow it. So I'm happiest, believe it or not, right here in my classroom. Or on the farm. I love being on the farm. There's a certain amount of exercise that I do there that keeps me busy, keeps me active, keeps me productive. Um, and you know, when you're working on a farm, you feel really task oriented. So you can check off that list daily. Well, I mean, here in this school, I have students of my uh, I have students who are the children of students that I've had in the past who specifically moved here or sent their child to be with me. But I have children who are doctors, lawyers. I have children who are doing amazing things. Uh, I have children who are traveling the world. That is what this is all about. Um, that's what this is all about. They're amazing success stories. I, I can tell you a real funny story. Uh, you know, we're out here in the summertime and one kid walked up to me, a child walked up to me and said, Miss asked me, Mr. Ritz, it's so hot, can you buy me a soda? And another kid turned around and said, you're asking Mr. Ritz to buy you a soda? Asking Mr. Ritz to buy you a soda is like asking your mama for a cigarette. Are you crazy? I love that. I love hearing that. Um, so the fact that we've created this kind of accountability and children know where I stand is important because I believe everybody needs a role model. You don't need a superstar, but you do need a role model. And if I could be a role model with a simple cheese hat and a cool little belt buckle and my little green shoes coming to work every day in a bow tie saying, si se puede, yes you can, that's the role of a lifetime. I mean, I love every subway in this borough. I think, you know, I've ridden all of them so much. Uh, Mayor de Blasio, if you're watching, we could use a little help, so help with the repairs, please. But every subway line in this borough has such meaningful, deep meaningful um, connections to me. Whether it was the two and the five in the 70s when it went through the South Bronx and what you saw. Whether it's the beautiful six train, you know, coming over the Cross Bronx Expressway over the Bruckner and the Sheridan. Wow, that gorgeous vista. Whether it's the four train, you know, going straight into the ground after you go past 161st Street or taking it all the way up to Woodlawn and seeing the vast memories of so many generations before us. Whether it's the one train taking you to the first golf course in America and straight down into the heights, you know, uh, by rice and bean heaven. Um, or the D train, you know, where else can you get in a, on a train in the Bronx and wind up in a beach in Brooklyn? That's awesome sauce. So I love them all. I wish they were working a little better. Um, the buses seem to be an issue, but now that we have these express buses, that is awesome. And I think transportation in this borough is the key. I would love to see a Metro North stop, so let me get a little political. We're sitting right here in Claremont Village. The train needs to stop here. We have 45,000 residents within eight square blocks. 
We shouldn't have to walk a mile to a train that, six, that gets us six minutes to Manhattan and 17 minutes to Westchester. So I love to see Metro North and you know all of those train lines think a little differently. Um, you know, we need to be smarter about transit. But the Bronx is reinventing itself daily. It's got a rhythm all its own. And that, to me, is what makes this place so special and why I'm proud to call it home. Sure, so please follow Green Bronx Machine on social media. We have Facebook, we have Twitter, we have Instagram. The kids and the team do a great job putting stories out there. Sign up for our monthly newsletter. We're not going to beat you up or hound you to death. We just want to share good news. You know, I always say your voice is your contribution. So please, join us online, share some of our stories, share some of our successes, celebrate our children. You can learn more about me at Stephen Ritz, S-T-E-P-H-E-N-R-I-T-Z dot com. You can follow me on social media. I try to be a voice of all things positive around health, wellness, education, sustainability, and growing something greater. Please check out my book, The Power of a Plant. It was a number one bestseller. Uh, all the proceeds support the program. And for those of you who are watching or listening, you can buy a new copy of my children's book called Make It Happen, which is a story of passion, purpose, and hope. And every dollar from that book, every penny is going to hire parents out of public housing to work in public schools in health, wellness, nutrition, and gardening programs. So my intent is to grow something greater and inspire healthy living and healthy learning all around the world. I'm Steve Ritz. I'm a parent. I'm an educator. I'm a farmer. And I'm filled with three things. Passion, purpose, and hope. And I love to wear a cheese hat. Thank you for watching Bronx Vignettes. Si, se puede.